we Americans are told to remember our history, but not all of it. Until September 23rd, there was not one national museum in the States dedicated to African American history. Uh, the Smithsonian's new museum of African American history and culture is, took years and years and years to, to open. And it's extraordinary that that preceded the opening of this exhibit here in Paris because both are landmarks and there's a lot of overlap between them. Um, some things that are not being shown in Paris are in the collection there, but they've borrowed a video montage. Um, one exceptional um, series of photos on the Great Migration. Um, just, it, it's just really, really beautiful. Um, so thanks to Lauren Wolf and Columbia for inviting me and for doing this series. Uh, you know, Paris has always been uh, a refuge and a home to African Americans. As many of us American expats can tell you, we're, we've always been very welcome here. And um, it's extraordinary that an exhibit that we've never seen in our own country is being shown here. Remember, it is something we hear all the time. School kids learn about the ride of Paul Revere, but not always Crispus Attucks, the runaway slave who was the first to die in the Boston Massacre. We're told to remember the Civil War, whose battles are still reenacted today, which I find really, really strange. Um, there are tens of thousands of plaques across the South remembering that war and the heroes of the Confederate States of America. Yet until very recently, there were no markers to slavery, to the generations of men, women, and children of color enslaved for over 250 years in the British colonies in the independent United States. We're implored to remember the Alamo, but not the war of attrition raised, ra waged on African Americans after the Civil War. Not Jim Crow, that system of legal segregation codifying white supremacy and perpetuating unspeakable racism into our lifetimes. We have monuments and ceremonies to remember the men who died for freedom in the First World War 100 years ago, but none to the nearly 4,000 African Americans lynched between 1877 and 1950. In 1919 alone, 77 black men were killed by lynch mobs. Many of those murders were public events, uh, with children among the gleeful crowd collecting fingers, toes, and ears as souvenirs. In the color line, there's a room dedicated to lynching, and the horror of it is leavened by some amazing art. But you will see the postcards that people would send marking the lynchings with, you know, happy to see you at the holidays on the back. Some of those men killed in 1919 were veterans in uniform. Two of them were burned alive. And of course, the greatest generation of the Second World War are still very much on our minds, in our books, and on our movie screens, but not all of them. Some men, even those who were stars in their day, were forgotten, and I'd like to tell you a bit about them. In June 2009, for the 65th anniversary of D-Day, the French government honored an American veteran named William Garfield Dabney. They gave him the Legion of Honor, the country's highest decoration, for his service on June 6, 1944. This is Omaha Beach in June of 2009. Bill was a member of the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion, the only African-American combat unit at D-Day. These men were charged with a strange mission to raise a curtain of silver balloons over Omaha and Utah beaches. The balloons form a defensive curtain over the coast to protect the men and materiel from dive bombing German planes. This is the only known photograph of the 320th on Omaha Beach. If an enemy plane snagged the cable, it would become trapped as if in a spider's web. A small bomb would descend, and if the strike was good, it would hit the wing or perhaps explode the gas tank. 
We reporters wrote about Bill Dabney in 2009 and noted that his battalion was all black. Well, what did that mean? Well, it meant that the enlisted men and some of the non-commissioned officers were black. Perhaps a few of the officers up to first lieutenant in this unit were black, but the top officers were always white. And this is Colonel Leon J. Reed, the commander of the 320th. Unlike many, or perhaps the majority, of uh, black units in the Army, um, the commanders were typically reviled, but Leon Reed, uh, a Citadel graduate, product of Kentucky, was revered by his men. He was beloved. Bill Dabney received his medal in a ceremony at Envalide, that French temple to all things military. He's wearing it in the backyard of his home in Roanoke, Virginia, for me. Um, Napoleon is buried under the Gold Dome. I'm sure most of you have been there. It was quite a ceremony. After it, Bill shook the hands of Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. Bill had no idea who they were until his son told him after, did you know whose hand you shook? But he knew very well about their movie and that there were no men of color storming Omaha Beach and saving Private Ryan because all black veterans knew this. In fact, no D-Day movies show black soldiers. This is a Robert Kappa photo, probably the most famous one. Uh, the photo on my book cover is also by Robert Kappa. We are very happy to find it. A few books about D-Day mentioned the 320th and that there were nearly 2,000 African American troops on the Normandy beaches by the end of that extraordinary day. This is uh, Omaha Beach on June 7th and you can see the barrage balloons flying. All of the balloons that were flown on land were flown by members of this battalion. The 320th was among two black units given a commendation by General Eisenhower for their service, yet we don't know about them. Well, why does that matter? Well, there are many who consider D-Day to be the most important day or one of the most important of the 20th century. For the Allied commanders knew that if they could get the troops onto those beaches up and over those bluffs, it was only a matter of time until their troops would be marching through Berlin. I would argue that to exclude a significant proportion of our population from that epic day does America a tremendous disservice. The great General Omar Bradley said that all men who landed on Omaha Beach were heroes, yet there were heroes among the heroes. As I began my research into this book, I learned that one of the men of the 320th, a college student, would become a star in black America and beyond for his service on Omaha Beach. He would be nominated for the Medal of Honor. He would not get it. Sorry. <laughs> None of the one million African Americans who served in World War II received America's highest honor until Bill Clinton awarded seven of them. Um, and this is Waverly Woodson. And this is his early Army picture. And this is um, the study, an epic study commissioned by the Army that led to those Medal of Honor um, awards by the president. Nine men were um, judged worthy of this medal, men who fought in World, War, in World War II, but only seven were given, and only one man was alive to receive the medal on that day at the White House. This extraordinary study showed that Black soldiers, deserving black soldiers, were denied the decorations they deserved and the opportunities they deserved. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Waverly Woodson. And I'll start with the approach to Omaha Beach uh, early morning, June 6, 1944. Waverly Woodson squinted into the distance from the deck of the boat, he could see little. A thick cloud blanket hung overhead and the heavy air pressed in from all sides. Drenched fatigues clung to Woodson's weary limbs. For hours now, he had peered into the blackness. A stripe of pink brightened the eastern horizon, first light. 
In the dark choppy waters of the English Channel, Woodson found serenity, even beauty. It would be one of his last tranquil moments on this very long day. It was a strange place to find peace. Above, the sky hummed with allied planes, and all around, thousands of vessels of every size steamed toward France. On Woodson's ship, men were gray with seasickness. Their single army issue vomit bag was long used up, so they heaved into their steel helmets, then tipped them over the side to be rinsed in the cresting swells. When that effort proved too much, they heaved wherever they could. Puddles of sick pooled at their ankles. The metal boat pitched forward and back with each roll. Dying would be better than this. Some of them said that. The storied channel had thwarted generations of marauders to keep Britannia safe, at least most of the time. The Roman Emperor Caligula's soldiers mutinied rather than sail these waters thick with mermaids. On this day, the invaders were heading in the opposite direction. Their mission to conquer a continent systematically crushed by an enemy for whom freedom meant very little. To Woodson, freedom meant a great deal. He had lived it fully for the first time in a friendly village in England, where he'd met white people pleased to be his friend and a postmistress happy to dance with him. That might not have seemed like much to other men, but Woodson would never forget it. Deafening boom shook the men to their soaking boots as the great battleships opened fire, each blast of their guns lighting the murky dawn with flame and smoke. The noise was almost impossible to believe. To Ernest Hemingway, who was aboard a small boat in the channel that day, it sounded as though they were throwing whole railway cars across the sky. The powerful concussion reverberated through the fleet and struck your ear like a punch with a heavy dry glove. An Associated Press reporter in one of those boats initially mistook the men's violent trembling for fear. Yet these men were ready. This was the day for which they had trained for years. For the British, with bitter memories of being driven back into the sea at Dunkirk in 1940, the wait had been far longer. The bombardment was an awesome display of might. Lieutenant General Omar Bradley, commander of the 1st U.S. Army, had promised his troops the greatest show on earth. The GIs and Tommies watching from the sea were certain that no enemy could survive it. For Woodson, this journey to France was a most unexpected chapter in his young life. Odds were low that a black man would be in this landing, yet Woodson was used to defying expectations. Unlike many of his friends in West Philadelphia, Woodson hadn't waited for a draft notice. He'd left his pre-med studies at Pennsylvania's Lincoln University, where he was in his second year, and enlisted in the Army on December 15, 1942. His younger brother, Eugene Lloyd, had signed up too and was stationed in Texas with a unit of the Tuskegee Airmen. It was a source of tremendous pride for their parents, and the doings of the Woodson brothers would become regular items in the newspapers back home. There were two armies in America in World War II, black and white. There were two of everything, barracks, mess halls, service clubs, buses, and train cars. It was a highly inefficient and extremely expensive way to run an army. Yet there was one sector that was integrated, officer candidate school. The army didn't think black men were smart enough to score high enough on the entrance exam, an exam heavily weighted to favor whites, so they didn't bother to set up a separate system. But Waverly Woodson scored high on the test and trained as an anti-aircraft artillery officer. In the end, there were no officer positions available to him. This was a common story for black officers whose service was limited by quotas and the rule that they not lead white officers junior to them. For, so Woodson was assigned to train as a medic with the 320th. On the morning of June 6th, he was headed for Omaha Beach with four other medics. In spite of the turbulent seas, the order to go had been a relief. Woodson and the four medics had endured several uncomfortable days aboard this metal bucket, jockeying for space with the five dozen men. Behind the boat carrying the medics, the rest of the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion was scattered among more than 150 landing craft. 
Thousands of barrage balloons had been inflated in England by Royal Air Force crews and tethered to ships and smaller craft for the journey to France. Floating high above the ships, the balloons formed a miles-wide aerial curtain, their shining silvery shapes carved in relief against the flat pewter sky. Their job was to protect the fleet from German dive bombers, which were loath to tangle with the lethal balloon cables. Once ashore, the men of the 320th would rush the balloons onto the beach, transferring the protective veil to land. Most of the 621 men in the assault force were headed to a five mile long crescent shaped patch of sand, once known as Beach 313. The Americans had renamed it Omaha, and it was one of the five beaches the Allies had to seize on June 6th in the 17 hours of daylight available to them. War planners expected a bloodbath on Omaha, the most challenging terrain where enemy guns lay hidden in scrub-covered bluffs as high as 170 feet. Omaha is where the medics were headed. They would be the first African Americans ashore if they made it to the beach alive. Woodson made it 